Welcome to this morning's service and we'll start off with some scripture. This morning's scripture is Psalm 96. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim good tidings of his salvation from day to day. Tell of his glory among the nations, his wonderful deeds among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendour and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in holy attire. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations the Lord reigns. Indeed, the world is firmly established, it will not be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all it contains. Let the field exult and all that is in it. Then all the trees of the forest will sing for joy before the Lord, for he is coming. For he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. Amen. And our first song is, I will sing unto the Lord.
The subject of my talk today is uh, re eight reasons why Jesus came to earth to die and we'll be focusing on Hebrews chapter 2. But before we look at Hebrews 2, if you've got your Bibles with you, please open them at Romans chapter 5 and we'll read a few verses from that chapter. We'll read from verses 6 through 11. <clears throat> Romans 5 verse, starting at verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we now have received the atonement. Just before we proceed, let's pray and put this before the Lord. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word. We thank you that your word draws us closer to you and helps us to understand you more clearly. And as we read your word today, Lord, I pray that uh, the words that I speak will be your words, not my words. And Lord, that they will speak to our hearts, opening your word to us, Lord, in a way that we can see Jesus more clearly and draw closer to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. In verse 8 that we've just read from Romans 5, uh, we see that God demonstrates his love toward us by the fact that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And in John 3.16, that well-known verse, we read, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus' death on the cross is the ultimate proof of God's love. He came to earth to pay the ultimate price for our sins. But can we discover anything more about why Jesus had to come to earth as a man and die a humiliating and painful death? Hebrews chapter 2 gives eight reasons why this had to happen. So I invite you to turn with me to this chapter and join with me as we explore those reasons in detail. We begin in chapter 2 and we'll read from verses 5 through to 9a. Chapter 2 of Hebrews, beginning at verse 5. For he has not put the world to come, of which we speak, in subjection to angels, but one testified in a certain place, saying, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honour, and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honour, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. In verses 6 through 8, Paul's reminding his readers of Psalm 8. Verse 6 quotes Psalm 8, verse 4. What is man that you are mindful of him? In context, this reads... What is mankind that you remember or think of him? Or we could put it another way. What is God's divine purpose for mankind? We find the answer to this question in verses 7 and 8 of our chapter. Verse 7 quotes Psalm 8 verse 5. For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honour. We're reminded that created man is made lower than the angels, both in time and in the order of creation. Verse 8 of Hebrews 2 quotes Psalm 8 verse 6, the beginning of it. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. God originally intended for everything to be put under man's authority. Do you remember what God said to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 1 verse 28? He said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Turning back to Psalm 8, verses 6b through 8, David continues by saying that God has put all things under his or, or man's feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the seas. Through Adam, God gave man dominion over the earth, but because of Adam's sin, this power was taken away. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 8 continues, For in that he, that's God, put all in subjection under him, 
that's man, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him, put under man. But now we do not yet see all things put under him. The principle of sin leading to death removed the power, but not the right or the authority to rule. While sin is still in the world, God's plan and purpose has been delayed, but God's plan and purpose has not been changed. God's plans and purposes are unchanging and unchangeable, and so we can be certain that this will come to pass at some time in the future. So we can see that God's divine plan for mankind didn't come into being at Christ's first advent. But it will be fulfilled at his second coming when, as we read in 20, Revelation 20 verse 6, that born-again believers will reign over the earth with Christ for a thousand years, quoting, they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. In verse 9a of Hebrews 2, the focus moves from mankind to Jesus. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honour. In verse 7, we read that man was made a little lower than the angels, and here we read that Jesus was made a little lower than the angels. But Jesus is the Son of God, the second part of the Trinity, and co-equal with God the Father. So how can this be? When Jesus came to earth, you remember he took on the position of a man. As a result, he was made a little lower than the angels and suffered death on the cross as a man. Unlike Adam, who was disobedient and died as a result of his sin, Jesus was obedient to his Father's will, even unto death. Verse 7 goes on to tell us that Jesus will be crowned with the same glory and honour as man. By becoming flesh and blood, sharing our afflictions, fully identifying himself with us, and through his humility and suffering, Jesus defeated the power of death. This makes it possible for God's promise that mankind will have dominion over the earth to be fulfilled both through Jesus' own dominion and that of the believers who will return to rule and reign with him in the millennium, as we've read in Revelation 20, verse 6. If Jesus hadn't taken complete humanity on himself, this would have been impossible. And so the first reason that Jesus came to earth as a man to die is to fulfil God's divine purpose for mankind. We find the second reason in the second half of verse 9, that he, that's Jesus, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Romans 6 verse 23 tells us that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The penalty for disobedience to God is spiritual death, the separation of man's soul from God. Are you one of those who's spiritually dead? Before one who is spiritually dead can come to life and be in fellowship with God, there's a price that must be paid. Do you remember what happened in the Garden of Eden after Adam and Eve had sinned? They disobeyed God. They'd eaten from the tree of the, of the knowledge of good. They covered their nakedness with fig leaves. But that only partly covered their skin. It wasn't enough to cover their sin. And so in Genesis 3 verse 21, we read that God made tunics of skin to clothe them. In order for this to be possible, the blood of an animal had to be shed. The price to be paid is a blood sacrifice. Hebrews 9 verse 22 reminds us that without the shedding of blood there can be no remission. Commentator David Guzik comments on this and says, Adam and Eve were clothed in a garment that was purchased with the life of another. We are clothed with a garment of righteousness that was purchased with the life of another, Jesus Christ. Jesus substituted his life for the life of the unbelieving sinner. But in order to be a substitute, it was necessary for him to be identified with man. Therefore, in order to offer himself as an acceptable sacrifice to God on man's behalf, he had to come to earth in human form. In other words, the very reason Jesus came to earth was that he might die for us. Romans 5 verse 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that whilst we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so the second reason Jesus came to earth as a man to die is that he should taste death for everyone. That the Son of God would give his life for sinners like us is an awesome thought and perhaps prompts us to ask why. The answer and the third reason he came to earth to die is in verse 10 and explained further in verses 11 through 13. In Hebrews 2 verse 10 we read the following. 
it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Christ is here described as the captain or the author of salvation, made perfect through his sufferings. The word perfect here speaks of his accomplishment or completion of the divine purpose for which he came. Christ, the sinless Son of God, fulfilled this purpose through his suffering on the cross. Once again, let me quote David Guzik. He says, conceivably, God could have engineered a way to save us that did not require the suffering of the Son of God. But it was fitting for Jesus to save us at the cost of his own agony. This is the ultimate illustration of the fact that real love, real giving, involves sacrifice. As David said when Arono offered to give him the threshing floor in 2 Samuel 24 verse 24, he said, No, but I will surely buy it from you for a price. Nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God with that which costs me nothing. You see, God's love for us had to show itself in sacrifice. And what could God sacrifice unless he added humanity to his deity and suffered on our behalf? It was fitting for the Father to do this. We read this in Isaiah 53 verse 10. We read that it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. Jesus' death was no circumstance. God had planned this as prophesied by Isaiah hundreds of years beforehand. This was not Satan's victory, neither was it man's victory, it was God's victory. This was God and Jesus, Father and Son, working together. In 2 Corinthians 5.19 we read that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. In Hebrews 2 verse 11 we read that we who are sanctified become one with Christ. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. Hebrews 10 verse 10 tells us that it was God's will for us to have been sacrificed, sorry, to have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Through our sanctification, we are made one with Christ, and the only way we can all be as one is if we all share the same humanity or all have one origin, and that's to be born of woman. Christ came to earth and became flesh. John 1.14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. For this very reason, he's not ashamed to call them, that's us, his brethren. Jesus could not call us his brethren unless he was human like us. Verse 12 quotes Psalm 22, that wonderful messianic psalm which speaks so clearly and eloquently of the crucifixion, resurrection and coming kingdom of Christ. Here he says not only that we are his brethren, but that he will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. Will I sing praise to you? Hebrews 2.13 quotes Isaiah 8 verses 17 and 18, verses that foreshadow the Messiah's identification with the people who have been rejected. Let's just read those two verses. Isaiah writes, And I will wait upon the Lord who hides his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. Here am I and the children whom the Lord has given me. We are for signs and wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells in Mount Zion. This is also reflected in the, the Lord's Prayer, which we find in John 17, verses 6 through 8, where we read, Jesus says, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they, and you, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. Christ so identified himself with mankind that he desires to look upon those who were born again as his brethren. Christ is united to us, and we are united to him. We are spiritually one. The fact that he calls us his brethren means that we and the Son of God share the same humanity and belong to the same family. Those of us who were born again worship him, adore him, follow him and hold fast to every word that he speaks. And he shares everything he has with us, even his glory. If we look at the world today, everything seems to revolve around so-called celebrities. Those who've made a rich living out of their looks or their ability to act in some unholy film or play. 
They are also worshipped, adored and followed. People believe everything they say. But would those celebrities share their fame, their glory and everything they have with their followers? Would they humble themselves to the point of suffering and death for their followers? There's an ever-widening chasm between the word of God and the world. Brothers and sisters, it's so easy for us all to be caught up in worldly values. But our focus must be on word values and not world values. That's a challenge to us all, isn't it? Where is our focus? Is it on the world or is it on the word? Verses 10 through 13 of Hebrews 11 give us the third reason that Jesus came to earth as a man to die, and that was to bring many sons to glory. The fourth reason is in verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Christ came to partake of flesh and blood, to become a mortal human being like us. He did this so that on our behalf he might destroy him who had the power of death, the devil. Satan, brothers and sisters, is the only one who can separate man's soul from God through spiritual death. Jesus' death brought divine judgment on Satan, sentencing him to be bound for a thousand years, as we read in Revelation 20, verses 2 and 3, and in Revelation 20, verse 10, finally consigning him to an eternity of torment in the lake of fire. It was at the cross that Jesus fought with Satan in order to break his power, and it was at the ninth hour during those final moments when he cried out in agony, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani! My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? When Jesus took upon himself the sins of the whole world, he was momentarily separated from his Father. And when we consider what that agony of separation really meant, only then can we begin to realise and understand the true cost of his sacrifice. It's worth pausing here for a moment to consider this question. On whose territory do we live? On whose territory do we live? Remember, Satan is the prince of the power of the air and the ruler of the world. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4 tells us he is the god of this world who's blinded the minds of them who do not believe. It's because of this that the world system and world views are so much in opposition to God and his word and why we as Christians are destined to trials, tribulation and persecution. But take a close look at what the scriptures point us toward. One day, Christ will come to take his church to be with himself at the time we call the rapture. And then, one day, we will return with him as victors to rule and reign with him. You know, brothers and sisters, Christ is coming back. He will return. And so the fourth reason Jesus came to earth as a man to die was in order to destroy Satan's rule over humanity. And that brings us to the fifth reason in verse 15. Christ came to release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Through his death, Jesus made it possible for mankind to be delivered from bondage to the fear of death. Ask any non-believer what they fear most and you'll most likely get the answer, death. Fear of the unknown is uppermost in many, if not most people's minds. The unsaved have no hope, except that they might disappear into oblivion and know nothing more. That's annihilationism. Or as some teach, return as a lion, a spider or a worm. And that's reincarnation. But let me ask you, where is your hope? Where is your hope? You see, as a believer, Romans 8 verse 1 tells us that, uh, that there is now for now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. That's the believer's hope. Jesus gives us a wonderful promise of assurance in John 5, 24. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. The Apostle John gives an even more emphatic assurance of everlasting life, when he says of believers in chapter 10, verse 28 of, of the gospel, they shall never perish. You know, 
The English translation doesn't give the true emphasis that's given by the original Greek for the word never. It's a, it's a Greek double negative. It's the Greek ou me, meaning not ever, ever, ever. That double negative ou me is then followed by the Greek word aeonai, meaning eternally, forever, without end. He, we can never, ever, ever, ever perish forever if we are in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 55 asks, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? When we walk in the Spirit of God and not in the flesh, we know the answer to that question. It's given us in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 56 and 57. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me ask you, let me ask you if you share that promise of assurance, if you know that you have that victory, do you believe it in your heart that you have that victory? If not, I urge you to turn to the Lord Jesus for, for your eternity today. And so the fifth reason Jesus came to earth as a man to die is to free those who were in bondage to the fear of death. Let Jesus set you free from that power. The sixth reason is in verses 16 and beginning of verse 17 of Hebrews 2. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, like that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. You see, Jesus came to be a merciful and faithful high priest. But we could ask ourselves a question as to why is this significant? What is the role of a priest? Well, a priest must first and foremost identify with the people he represents. For Jesus to do this, it was necessary for him to take on flesh and become one of us. He had to be made like unto his brethren. Jesus didn't take on the nature of an angel. He took on the nature of the seed of Abraham. He took on human nature as human flesh, as a man. Because of this, Christ can identify with us in our sufferings. A priest also acts as mediator between man and God. He, he represents man before God. He intercedes before God on behalf of the people. And we read later in Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 that he, that's Jesus, is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. And in Hebrews 6 verse 20 and Hebrews 7 verse 17 and 7 verse 21, we read that Jesus is a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. In other words, unlike earthly priests who died and needed to be replaced, his priesthood is for eternity. Jesus is forever interceding for us. And so the sixth reason Jesus came to earth as a man to die is to become a merciful and faithful high priest to mankind for eternity. The seventh reason is in verse 17b. He came to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. 1 John 2 verse 2 tells us he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world. Christ is the propitiation for our sins. In other words, he appeased God by becoming our sacrifice and shedding his own blood. And not just for our sins, not just for your sins and for my sins, but for the sins of the whole world. For Jewish people today, this would remind them of the most significant day in their calendar. That's the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur. That was when the high priest, after cleansing himself and offering a sacrifice for his own sin, entered into the very presence of God in the Holy of Holies. Covered by the clouds of smoke from, the burnt, from burning coals on the altar of incense, the priest stood before God on behalf of a guilty people and sprinkled the blood of the sin offering on the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies, effectively sprinkling the sacrificial blood over the broken law, covering the sins of the people. The sacrifice was a substitutionary death for a guilty people, and in God's eyes the penalty of the law for sin had been paid. By this act their sins were forgiven. The nation's sin was then confessed over the head of the scapegoat, and the scapegoat was led into the wilderness, symbolically removing their sin. 
However, unlike the scapegoat of the Old Testament, Jesus not only symbolically removed our sins, but he completely removed our sins. He took those sins upon himself on the cross, bearing not only our sins, but those of all mankind. And he didn't just bear the sins, he paid the penalty, death in full. Through his selfless act and shed blood, we have been reconciled to God. Christ, by his death on the cross, provided propitiation of our sin. He reconciled us to God, and as we read in Psalm 103, verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Praise the Lord. The seventh reason Jesus came to earth as a man to die is to reconcile us to God. And we come to the eighth and the final reason, which we find in verse 18. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succour or to help them that are tempted. You see, God cannot be tempted. James 1 verse 13 tells us that. God cannot be put to the test. We read that in Deuteronomy 6 verse 16 and Matthew 4 verse 7. And yet, Jesus was both tempted and put to the test. And for that to happen, he had to become flesh and blood. Then, not only could Jesus be tempted, but he could fully identify with us in our temptations and trials. This doesn't mean that Jesus identifies with our sin, because he is the sinless Son of God. On the Mount of Temptation, Jesus enticed him to break the law. His temptation came from without, from Satan. But our temptation comes from within. That's the sin nature in us. However, because Christ understands the nature of temptation, he can identify with us when we are tempted. It's worth remembering that Jesus, whilst not having a fallen sin nature, lived in a corruptible earthly body and was therefore subject to the same sufferings we are. As a result, Christ is a sympathetic, compassionate, merciful and faithful high priest but his sympathy is related to our suffering and not our sin. We're constantly being tempted and buffeted by the world's values. Submission to sin's waiting around every corner, and if we're not ever watchful, we will succumb. It's of great comfort to know that we have an advocate in heaven who understands our weaknesses and is able to help us in our hour of need. And so our eighth and final reason why Jesus came to earth as a man to die was to help us in our temptations or in our testings. And so as we draw to a close, let's remind ourselves of the eight reasons why Jesus had to come to earth as a man and die. Firstly, verses 5 through 9a of Hebrews 2, to fulfil God's purpose for mankind. Secondly, in verse 9b, to taste death for all. Thirdly, in verses 10 through 13, to bring many sons to glory. And fourthly, in verse 14, to destroy the devil. The fifth reason in verse 15 is to deliver those in bondage. The sixth reason in verses 16 and 17a was to become a high priest for mankind. And, in verse, and the seventh reason in verse 17b, to make reconciliation for our sins. And then finally in verse 18, we see the eighth reason to provide help for those who are tested. Knowing Christ as Saviour requires us to obey him and continually submit to his will, not our own. Through the shed blood of Christ on the cross, our sins have been forgiven and we can come into the presence of a holy God. What's more, for those who are truly born again, there's a blessed assurance and promise of eternal life. Remember John 10 verses 27 and 28. Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never, there we go again, that's that double negative, ooh, me, followed by aeon, they shall never, 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 ever, ever, ever perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. There's that double assurance for us there. Finally, in John 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. And in Acts 4 verse 12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Brothers and sisters, we've discovered eight reasons why Jesus had to come to earth as a man and die. 
But let me just ask you this question. Are you someone who fears death? The Apostle Paul had no fear of death. He said in Philippians 1 verse 21, For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. And so let me ask you another question. Have you passed from death through sin unto life eternal? Have you passed from death through sin unto life eternal? Are you secure in the knowledge that you are in Christ Jesus? Or are you one of those that have yet to believe in his death and resurrection and cry out to him to save you? My prayer today, brothers and sisters, and for all of those who might be listening to this message, is that you can all feel secure and be secure in that hope and unbreakable promise of eternal life that we have through Jesus' sacrifice. But if you're one of those who hasn't yet called on the only name under heaven by which man can be saved, I urge you not to to put this message away, not to leave the building without seriously considering all we have heard and, and, and speaking to someone about this. Call, call Pastor Jeff or one of the elders and, and talk with them. And so as we come to the end of our talk today, I thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for giving me the opportunity to share this fellowship with you, even though it's remotely. And pray that the Lord will seal his eternal word in our hearts. And more, more so than that, to give glory to the Lord for all that he does for us and all that he is doing for us and all that he will do for us. And so we thank you, thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. And our last song is Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus.